Section three of the Day Boy and the Night Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Day Boy and the Night Girl. The Romance of Photogen and Nycteris by George MacDonald. Chapters ten through eleven. Chapter ten. The Great Lamp. It was some time before she had a second opportunity of going out, for Falca, since the fall of the lamp, had been a little more careful, and seldom left her for long. But one night, having a little headache, Nycteris lay down upon her bed, and was lying with her eyes closed when she heard Falca come to her, and felt she was bending over her. Disinclined to talk, she did not open her eyes, and lay quite still. Satisfied that she was asleep, Falca left her, moving so softly that her very caution made Nycteris open her eyes and look after her, just in time to see her vanish, through a picture, as it seemed, that hung on the wall a long way from the usual place of issue. She jumped up, her headache forgotten, and ran in the opposite direction, got out, groped her way to the stair, climbed, and reached the top of the wall. Alas, the great room was not so light as the little one she had left. Why? Sorrow of sorrows, the great lamp was gone. Had its globe fallen, and its lovely light gone out upon great wings, a resplendent firefly oaring itself through a yet grander and lovelier room? She looked down to see if it lay anywhere broken to pieces on the carpet below. But she could not even see the carpet. But surely nothing very dreadful could have happened. No rumbling or shaking, for there were all the little lamps, shining brighter than before, not one of them looking as if any unusual matter had befallen. What if each of those little lamps was growing into a big lamp, and after being a big lamp for a while, had to go out and grow a bigger lamp still, out there beyond this out? Ah, here was the living thing that could not be seen, come to her again, bigger to-night, with such loving kisses and such liquid strokings of her cheeks and forehead, gently tossing her hair and delicately toying with it but it ceased, and all was still. Had it gone out? What would happen next? Perhaps the little lamps had not to grow great lamps, but to fall one by one, and go out first? With that came from below a sweet scent, and then another, and another. Ah, how delicious! Perhaps they were all coming to her only on their way out after the great lamp. Then came the music of the river, which she had been too absorbed in the sky to note the first time. What was it? Alas, alas, another sweet living thing on its way out. They were all marching slowly out in long lovely file, one after the other, each taking its leave of her as it passed. It must be so. Here were more and more sweet sounds, following and fading. The whole of the out was going out again. It was all going after the great lovely lamp. She would be left the only creature in the solitary day. Was there nobody to hang up a new lamp for the old one, and keep the creatures from going? She crept back to her rock, very sad. She tried to comfort herself by saying that anyhow there would be room out there, but as she said it she shuddered at the thought of empty room. When next she succeeded in getting out, a half-moon hung in the east. A new lamp had come, she thought, and all would be well. It would be endless to describe the phases of feeling through which Nycteris passed, more numerous and delicate than those of a thousand changing moons. A fresh bliss bloomed in her soul with every varying aspect of infinite nature. Ere long she began to suspect that the new moon was the old moon, gone out and come in again like herself, also that, unlike herself, it wasted and grew again, that it was indeed a live thing, subject like herself to caverns, innkeepers, and solitudes, escaping and shining when it could. Was it a prison like hers it was shut in, and did it grow dark when the lamp left it? Where could be the way into it? With that, first she began to look below, as well as above and around her, and then first noted the tops of the trees between her and the floor. There were palms with their red-fingered hands full of fruit, eucalyptus trees crowded with little boxes of powder puffs, oleanders with their half-cast roses, and orange trees with their clouds of young silver stars, and their aged balls of gold. Her eyes could see colors invisible to ours in the moonlight. 
and all these she could distinguish well, though at first she took them for the shapes and colors of the carpet of the great room. She longed to get down among them, now she saw they were real creatures, but she did not know how. She went along the whole length of the wall to the end that crossed the river, but found no way of going down. Above the river she stopped to gaze with awe upon the rushing water. She knew nothing of water but from what she drank and what she bathed in, and as the moon shone on the dark, swift stream, singing lustily as it flowed, she did not doubt that the river was alive, a swift rushing serpent of life, going out, whither, and then she wondered if what was brought into her rooms had been killed that she might drink it and have her bath in it. Once when she stepped out upon the wall, it was into the midst of a fierce wind. The trees were all roaring. Great clouds were rushing along the skies and tumbling over the little lamps. The great lamp had not come yet. All was in tumult. The wind seized her garments and hair and shook them as if it would tear them from her. What could she have done to make the gentle creature so angry? Or was this another creature altogether, of the same kind, but hugely bigger, and of a very different temper and behavior? But the whole place was angry. Or was it that the creatures dwelling in it, the wind, and the trees, and the clouds, and the river, had all quarreled, each with all the rest? Would the whole come to confusion and disorder? But as she gazed wandering and disquieted, the moon, larger than ever she had seen her, came lifting herself above the horizon to look, broad and red, as if she, too, were swollen with anger that she had been roused from her rest by their noise, and compelled to hurry up to see what her children were about, thus rioting in her absence, lest they should rack the whole frame of things. And as she rose, the loud wind grew quieter and scolded less fiercely, the trees grew stiller and moaned with a lower complaint, and the clouds hunted and hurled themselves less wildly across the sky. And, as if she were pleased that her children obeyed her very presence, the moon grew smaller as she ascended the heavenly stair. Her puffed cheeks sank, her complexion grew clearer, and a sweet smile spread over her countenance, as peacefully she rose and rose. But there was treason and rebellion in her court, for ere she reached the top of her great stairs, the clouds had assembled, forgetting their late wars, and very still they were as they laid their heads together and conspired. Then combining, and lying silently in wait until she came near, they threw themselves upon her and swallowed her up. Down from the roof came spots of wet, faster and faster, and they wetted the cheeks of Nycteris. And what could they be but the tears of the moon, crying because her children were smothering her? Nycteris wept too, and, not knowing what to think, stole back in dismay to her room. The next time she came out in fear and trembling. There was the moon still, away in the west, poor indeed, and old, and looking dreadfully worn, as if all the wild beasts in the sky had been gnawing at her. But there she was, alive still, and able to shine. CHAPTER Eleven: THE SUNSET Knowing nothing of darkness, or stars, or moon, Photogen spent his days in hunting. On a great white horse he swept over the grassy plains, glorying in the sun, fighting the wind, and killing the buffaloes. One morning, when he happened to be on the ground a little earlier than usual, and before his attendants, he caught sight of an animal unknown to him, stealing from a hollow into which the sun-rays had not yet reached. Like a swift shadow it sped over the grass, slinking southward to the forest. He gave chase, noted the body of a buffalo it had half eaten, and pursued it the harder. But with great leaps and bounds the creature shot farther and farther ahead of him, and vanished. Turning, therefore, defeated, he met Fargu, who had been following him as fast as his horse could carry him. "'What animal was that, Fargu?' he asked. "'How he did run!' Fargu answered he might be a leopard, but he rather thought from his pace and look that he was a young lion. "'What a coward he must be!' said Photogen. "'Don't be too sure of that,' rejoined Fargu. "'He is one of the creatures the sun makes uncomfortable.' As soon as the sun is down, he will be brave enough. He had scarcely said it when he repented, nor did he regret it the less when he found that Photogen made no reply. But alas, said was said. Then, said Photogen to himself, that contemptible beast is one of the terrors of sundown, of which Madame Watho spoke. He hunted all day, but not with his usual spirit. 
he did not ride so hard, and did not kill one buffalo. Fargu, to his dismay, observed also that he took every pretext for moving farther south, nearer to the forest. But all at once, the sun now sinking in the west, he seemed to change his mind, for he turned his horse's head and rode home so fast that the rest could not keep him in sight. When they arrived, they found his horse in the stable, and concluded that he had gone into the castle. But he had, in truth, set out again by the back of it. Crossing the river a good way up the valley, he reascended to the ground they had left, and just before sunset reached the skirts of the forest. The level orb shone straight in between the bare stems, and saying to himself he could not fail to find the beast, he rushed into the wood. But even as he entered, he turned and looked to the west. The rim of the red was touching the horizon, all jagged with broken hills. Now, said Photogen, we shall see. But he said it in the face of a darkness he had not proved. The moment the sun began to sink among the spikes and saw edges, with a kind of sudden flap at his heart, a fear inexplicable laid hold of the youth, and as he had never felt anything of the kind before, the very fear itself terrified him. As the sun sank, it rose like the shadow of the world, and grew deeper and darker. He could not even think what it might be, so utterly did it enfeeble him. When the last flaming scimitar edge of the sun went out like a lamp, his horror seemed to blossom into very madness. Like the closing lids of an eye, for there was no twilight, and this night no moon, the terror and the darkness rushed together, and he knew them for one. He was no longer the man he had known, or rather thought himself. The courage he had had was in no sense his own. He had only had courage, not been courageous. It had left him, and he could scarcely stand, certainly not stand straight, for not one of his joints could he make stiff or keep from trembling. He was but a spark of the sun, in himself nothing. The beast was behind him, stealing upon him. He turned. All was dark in the wood, but to his fancy the darkness here and there broke into pairs of green eyes, and he had not the power even to raise his bow-hand from his side. In the strength of despair he strove to rouse courage enough, not to fight, that he did not even desire, but to run. Courage to flee home was all he could ever imagine, and it would not come. But what he had not was ignominiously given him. A cry in the wood, half a screech, half a growl, sent him running like a boar-wounded cur. It was not even himself that ran, it was the fear that had come alive in his legs. He did not know that they moved. But as he ran he grew able to run, gained courage at least to be a coward. The stars gave a little light. Over the grass he sped, and nothing followed him. How fallen, how changed, from the youth who had climbed the hill as the sun went down, a mere contempt to himself, the self that contemned, was a coward with the self it contemned. There lay the shapeless black of a buffalo humped upon the grass. He made a wide circuit and swept on like a shadow driven in the wind, for the wind had arisen, and added to his terror. It blew from behind him. He reached the brow of the valley and shot down the steep descent like a falling star. Instantly the whole upper country behind him arose and pursued him, the wind came howling after him, filled with screams, shrieks, yells, roars, laughter, and chattering, as if all the animals of the forest were careering with it. In his ears was a trampling rush, the thunder of the hoofs of the cattle, in career from every quarter of the wide plains to the brow of the hill above him. He fled straight for the castle, scarcely with breath enough to pant. As he reached the bottom of the valley, the moon peered up over its edge. He had never seen the moon before, except in the daytime, when he had taken her for a thin, bright cloud. She was a fresh terror to him, so ghostly, so ghastly, so gruesome, so knowing as she looked over the top of her garden wall upon the world outside. That was the night itself, the darkness alive, and after him, the horror of horrors coming down the sky to curdle his blood and turn his brain to a cinder. He gave a sob and made straight for the river, where it ran between the two walls at the bottom of the garden. He plunged in, struggled through, clambered up the bank, and fell senseless on the grass. End of section 3